1965, Indonesia experienced one of the largest mass murders in history, with the execution of over one million civilians. According to the Huffington Post of September 6, 2013, nearly 50 years later, many of the men who ordered and carried out the executions still hold power within the country. This prompted Texas native and documentarian Joshua Oppenheimer to spend eight years interviewing the perpetrators in an attempt to understand the pride which they hold for their actions. And thus, the act of killing was created. In his now Oscar-nominated 150-minute documentary, Oppenheimer not only interviews the perpetrators, but also allows them to recreate their crimes in whatever style of American cinema they wish. Given that the true history of the events of 1965 are still unknown to many Indonesian victims and survivors, and that the New Yorker of July 16, 2013 explains that these recreations allow the killers to rupture the stories they have originally told themselves, offering a new model of how a nation may begin to cope with its traumatic past, we must ask today's research question. How does the use of performative recreation alter the rhetorical processes that aid in national healing? To answer this question, we will turn to Tori Lockler's paper, The Truth and Reconciliation Commission, or TRC, Dialogic Healing or Gross Injustice, presented at the 2009 National Communication Association Convention. In her paper, Lockler examines the TRC hearings of post-apartheid South Africa, as well as outlining the elements necessary for dialogic healing to occur, making it ideal for our analysis of Oppenheimer's efforts to achieve the same goals through documentary and recreation. Today, we will examine Lockler's model, apply it to the act of killing before finally drawing critical implications of a project that Oppenheimer tells The Daily Show of August 13, 2013, was like walking into Germany 40 years after the Holocaust. But the Nazis were still in power. In her paper, Lockler examines the TRC hearings of post-apartheid South Africa as a form of dialogue between the families of victims and the perpetrators of crimes. To better understand how the hearings function as dialogical healing, Lockler outlines three key tenets. Distinction between I, thou, and I, it. Lack of overt persuasion. And understanding without excuse. First, distinction between I, thou, and I, it. Lockler draws on Martin Buber's definition of dialogue, which involves turning to the other. Essentially, each member within the conversation must view the other as a thou rather than an it, a person versus an object. Lockler explains that space can also help orientate participants to view each other as people. Second, lack of overt persuasion. While all communication is inherently persuasive, in order for dialogue to occur, neither side is persuaded to change their viewpoint, but rather to simply see the other side. By primarily focusing on the stories people tell, a TRC creates a clearer picture of what happened than an official report, without being corrupted by persuasion. Finally, Understanding without excuse. Lockler explains that the potential for healing comes from the opening of one's heart to the other. This does not accept the actions of perpetrators, but rather demonstrates a willingness to see the side of the oppressor. Victims are able to understand the actions of killers, and perpetrators are given the opportunity to tell their stories without judgment, creating a space in which healing can begin. Oppenheimer's project was originally centered around telling the untold stories of Indonesian victims and survivors. However, they were fearful that if they were to speak out, they would be persecuted. Therefore, he chose instead to tell the stories of Indonesian death squad leaders. To better understand his efforts, we will now apply Lockler's model directly to the act of killing. <coughs> First, distinction between I, thou, and I, it. The act of killing allows Indonesian death squad leaders to recreate their crimes, with Oppenheimer speaking on behalf of the victims. Democracy Now! of July 19, 2013 explains that the film's primary focus, Anwar Congo, after recreating a scene in which he pretends to be strangled with a wire, tells Oppenheimer that he felt terrible, and he wonders if his victims had similar feelings. Because the perpetrators were able to form a relationship with Oppenheimer, a human face is attached to their crimes, turning Oppenheimer from an it to a thou. Similarly, the conversations held with Oppenheimer show a more human side of the killers. By allowing both the perpetrators and the director to become people rather than objects, a space for dialogue is created, fulfilling our first tenet. Second, lack of overt persuasion. 
Oppenheimer explained to the New York Times of July 14, 2013, that by allowing the killers to tell their stories on their terms, we are able to understand something about the entire system of destruction. For example, one of the film's perpetrators, Safit Pardide, when discussing his past actions, states, Fuck em. Fuck everyone I meet. Especially if they're a 14-year-old. Delicious. I'd say it's going to be hell for you, but heaven on earth for me. While horrific, the film withholds judgment, so that these stories that are, as author and scholar of Indonesian history John Rusa states, an open secret, can be seen and heard by victims and survivors, allowing them to understand the entire story, creating a space in which dialogue can begin. Finally, understanding without excuse. While perpetrators are able to dictate which massacres they recreate, there is still a potential for them to come to terms with their actions. After recreating his crimes, Anwar Congo asks the question, have I sinned? Right before he becomes choked up and states, I did this to so many people, Josh. The April 2013 issue of Inside Indonesia explains that several Indonesian audiences cried recalling their trauma, but they all agreed that the spell of the state of terror and propaganda had been broken by the film. They saw at least one killer, Anwar Congo, who had been broken by his crimes. By allowing both the audiences and the perpetrators to see the crimes in official capacity, a space where healing can start is made, fulfilling our final tenet. After applying Lockler's model to the act of killing, we can finally return to today's research question. How does the use of performative recreation alter the rhetorical <coughs> processes that aid in national healing? The act of killing demonstrates how performance can be used as a tool for reconciliation. Specifically, perpetrators are able to better connect with their victims, and audiences of the film are able to understand the actions of death squad leaders. This power potential of documentary as an alternative to, TR to TRC can be explored further through two implications. First, the frame of cinema may be one of the few ways to engage in TRC while perpetrators of crime still hold power. Because a TRC typically looks more like a trial than a dialogue, leaders of nations are hesitant to participate. However, because these men had a long-standing history with the American cinema, they were more than willing to drop their power and persuasion and to just tell their stories, demonstrating how film can reach beyond cultural barriers. Consequently, film may be a good venue for writers to engage these types of oppressive regimes, as it can lead to the revelation of hidden secrets and stories without the political ramifications of a more traditional TRC. As Oppenheimer states in the LA Review of Books of August 14, 2013, a film cannot change Indonesia. A film can simply create a space in which Indonesians can change Indonesia. Second, while the film sheds light on the actions of death squad leaders, it fails to acknowledge the full involvement of Western governments within the massacres, essentially whitewashing the culpability of nations like the United States. The previously cited New Yorker explains that the US government not only provided weapons to the anti-communist movement, they also ran covert bombing missions and gave names to death squads. Hmm. Tenet's locker of understanding without excuse is dependent on a full understanding by all events, by, of all events by all parties involved. Therefore, by only vaguely addressing the involvement of outside governments, the blame for the massacres is placed solely on the Indonesian government within the film. Therefore, as an American audience, it is vital that we work to understand the entire history and context of the events of the film in order to help facilitate rec reconciliation between the Indonesian victims and those who aided in their suffering. Today, we have examined Lockler's model, applied it to the act of killing before finally drawing critical implications. The act of killing is receiving worldwide critical acclaim, not only for its production, but also for the stories it tells and how. It's time that the citizens of Indonesia are shown the truth and given justice. As the film's producer, Werner Herzog states, art doesn't make a difference until it does.